Thank you so much, Dean Mavlava. Thank you all. I have the privilege of being a card-carrying member of Nergis's fan club. <laughs> Imagine how honored I am just to know her and how honored I have been to be invited to be with all of you today. As we celebrate something truly important, your achievement of an advanced degree in the presence of your family and friends. An advanced degree in science is a big deal. <laughs> to have done this in the time of COVID makes it even more impressive. You're a historic class. Perhaps your timing in graduate school was not ideal, but your timing to obtain an advanced degree in science is impeccable. For two reasons. First of all, the potential for scientific discoveries in so many fields now is absolutely breathtaking. Almost hard to believe, it's so exciting. You really might discover life on other planets. You might invent the pill that will delay old age. Please hurry on that. <laughs> For certain, you will discover things we cannot even imagine. But in addition, the need for scientific approaches to major problems the world is grappling with has seldom seemed greater. Let's face it, my generation left you with some serious challenges. Climate change, the possible extinction of many species, health inequality, and a virus that brought the world to its knees. Just to ensure you feel sufficiently challenged, even as we need science to help us solve all these problems, we're grappling with science skepticism and toxic political polarization around science. You won the opportunity lottery. It's the best possible time ever to have been a scientist, I think. But you also won the responsibility lottery. You may be the last generation that can save the planet, can save the ecosystem, can save democracy. Graduation speakers are urged to advise young people at this juncture in their lives, particularly about launching career. So why, you may be asking yourself, did the dean select this grandmotherly looking person for this task? Good question. Perhaps Taylor Swift was not available. <laughs> During my years on the MIT faculty, I was a molecular biologist, and like you, I was at the cutting edge of science. It was my passion throughout my career. But as the dean indicated, I had a second totally unexpected career at MIT as an activist for women in science. I suspect she wants me to tell you about combining two careers like that in science. And this is a very personal story and relevant to my being a woman at a certain time in science. It speaks to the powerful allure of science and to issues for women. But I mean it to be more than that. I hope I will leave you thinking about, more broadly, the possibilities for science to lead the way for social change. It may enrich your career as it did mine, as you will see from this funny story. I hope funny. I fell in love with molecular biology at age 19 as an undergraduate course at Harvard taught by James D. Watson. Yes, that James D. Watson, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. In a single hour, he convinced me that DNA was the secret of life. It was 1963, the genetic code was still being cracked. But already you could imagine that one day we would find the genes for everything. Maybe even cancer genes, perhaps a math gene. I raced to Watson's office and asked to work in his lab, and he said yes. Passion for science has driven my life ever since. As many of you who are graduating here today already know, falling in love with science is easy. Finding a path to being a scientist can be tricky. It was very tricky for women in my generation who wanted to do high-level research in academia. There was no path. There were essentially no such women. To pursue my passion, I came up with what I now think of as Plan A. I would do Nobel Prize worthy science for a few years, then I'd quit science and follow a husband wherever he went and move on to raising a family. I didn't want a PhD, I just wanted to do science. I set my sights on one of the biggest unanswered questions during the dawn of molecular biology. Can proteins, then known as repressors, bind to specific sequences on DNA to control gene expression? 
I found a promising junior fellow at Harvard, a man who was equally ambitious and equally obsessed with this problem, and I convinced him to hire me as his technician. We did an experiment that was very risky and brutally hard, but it worked, and it was thrilling. I was 24, I was ready to retire. <laughs> but given this success, Jim Watson insisted I get a PhD, so on to plan B. By now I was married, and since I was ahead of schedule in achieving my scientific goal, I thought, okay, I'll give a, get a PhD to please my mentor while I wait for my husband to make his next career move. I ground through the PhD requirements, you know the drill, and even had time to start a postdoc learning methods for working with cancer cells and their viruses. Little did I know that a whole new plan would soon be needed. I'll call it plan C, but it was the opposite of planned. Never underestimate the power of luck, both good and bad. Shortly after I obtained my PhD, very unexpectedly, my marriage dissolved. That was the bad luck. But while I was reeling from that, a new possibility presented itself. By then, the early 1970s, society was changing. Civil rights, affirmative action, and the women's movement had pried open the doors of universities so that women could come in. And President Nixon had just launched the war on cancer, a field I had dreamed of working in had I planned to stay in science. The molecular biology of cancer field was about to break wide open, and I was being recruited to a job at MIT to work in its spectacular new cancer center. Talk about good luck. My unplanned divorce had even solved the intractable problem for so many women in my generation of how to combine children with high-powered careers in science. I would not have children. Took care of that problem. <laughs> I embraced Plan C with a vengeance. I had it made. I won tenure at MIT and might have stayed just working on cancer for years to come. The field was thrilling. But life is not so simple, and ahead of me lay a very surprising Plan D. As a professor, I began to encounter obstacles that made it hard to do science. Was it the field, or possibly something else? To find out, I decided to do something radical. I would change fields. Being a scientist, I'll do an experiment. I chose the zebrafish as a model system which offered the super high risk but exciting possibility of identifying genes required for early vertebrate development. I soon found that I still couldn't get the resources required to do my science, resources that my male faculty colleagues seemed to have. Just to be sure, I took a tape measure and measured the lab and equipment spaces of all the faculty in the building. I had less, less than starting assistant professors and I was a senior faculty. So the problem wasn't the field, but it, could it possibly be because I was a woman? Why would gender matter? Science is supposed to be a meritocracy. Finally, at age 50, after 20 years of careful observation, I started to understand Gender did matter because I realized a scientific idea, result, or discovery was valued differently. It was undervalued if people believed it was made by a woman. By the way, it would have helped enormously if I had known that psychologists had already made my discovery. <laughs> they had documented the phenomenon experimentally and gave it a name, unconscious bias. A Nobel Prize in economics would later go to a psychologist for discovering how unconscious biases influence our judgments. That's how important this discovery is of how our brains work. Well, now I thought I knew the probable explanation for my problems, but what was the remedy? I tried to explain this fascinating form of unconscious bias to those in charge of resources. It did not go well. <laughs> and I could understand why. It had taken me 20 years to understand it. I suspected I would not have believed it if I had not experienced it. I consulted a lawyer and considered suing MIT. But how could I become an adversary of an institution I loved? I was at an impasse. I considered quitting science altogether. And this is where passion comes in, I think. Passion for zebrafish triumphed over all. I couldn't live without science. I had to find a solution. Enter Plan D. I drafted a letter to then MIT President Charles Vest informing him of an important discovery. Dear sir, your institution is discriminating against its women faculty. 
I'm sure if you understood this, you would fix it. I thought I'd better run the letter by another professor. I chose the first woman faculty in the School of Science to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And it proved to be the turning point in this story. She read my draft letter and said, I agree with every word you wrote. And she said, I'd like to sign this letter too. One woman's problems might be attributed to her special circumstances, but two together, one of them a member of the National Academy of Sciences had power. We looked at each other. If more women signed on, we'd have even more power. It didn't take long to survey the other women in the School of Science. At the time, there were 197 tenured men on the science faculty, just 15 women. We decided to talk to them and included two women who had joint appointments from engineering to increase our sample size. It turned out the other women had had the same thoughts that we did, and like us, they too had had trouble speaking up. But 16 of us agreed to work together to solve the problem. We decided not to write to the president, but to devise our own solution, because that's what scientists do. We realized you needed two types of data, numerical data to document discrepancies, plus the experiences of the women faculty themselves, which could illuminate how a strange kind of marginalization and undervaluation could lead to inequities. We asked the then MIT Dean of Science, Bob Bergenau, to set up a committee to look at salaries and lab space, the allocation of teaching and committee assignments, and distribution of pots of university funds and other resources. He agreed. The story that emerged was more than enough to convince the dean, and he quickly fixed the inequities. But there was more to come. In 1999, the chair of the MIT faculty, a woman, asked us to write a summary of our work for publication in the MIT faculty newsletter. Then she asked MIT's then president, President Best, if he would write a comment to accompany this article. President Best had seen the data in our report. He wrote, I have always believed that contemporary gender discrimination within universities is part reality and part perception. True, but I now understand that reality is by far the greater part of the balance. This story, and that quote from the MIT president, was picked up by a young reporter at the Boston Globe and it soon hit the front page. Two days later, it appeared on the front page of the New York Times and it quickly went around the world. That's when we learned from an avalanche of emails that this was not an MIT problem, but one that affected women in workplaces everywhere. A few weeks later, I was quite startled to find myself at the White House. <laughs> President and Mrs. Clinton shook my hand and said, thank you on behalf of the nation. I literally looked behind me, were they talking to me? I just. <laughs> In front of a wall of cameras, they each gave a speech explaining why all universities should do studies like MIT's to ensure an equitable workplace for women. Well, now that MIT's president and President Clinton had announced there was a problem, people expected MIT to fix it. I was about to get a lesson in how institutional change happens. President Vest and his provost and chancellor appointed me in a committee of senior women and minority faculty to work with the MIT administration to devise institution-wide remedies to prevent and correct the consequences of unconscious biases on faculty's careers. The approach, of course, included a lot of data gathering to ensure equity in resources and hiring for all faculty, rewriting family leave policies, building daycare on campus, recruiting women and minority faculty to power administrative positions. And all of these efforts have continued to this day and expanded in successive administrations of Hockfield and Rife. You probably aren't surprised that MIT has had a woman president and a woman dean of science, or that five of nine department chairs in engineering today are women, and several of the nine are people of color. I bet you aren't surprised that today junior women faculty routinely take family leave, have babies, and go on to get tenure, and male faculty are perfectly comfortable pushing baby carriages on campus or asking for time off to care for a child. In my generation, such things were rare, even unimaginable. Today, they are the norm. The world has changed just in time for all of you. Not everything is fixed, of course. We left that to you. Today, 20% of MIT science and engineering faculty are women. But to me, that number is less important than the fact that every one of you graduating today can become a professor, could win a Nobel Prize, and can have a family too if you choose. 
It's well known, and research supports it, that when you equalize opportunity for historically underrepresented people, you actually make life better for everyone. The women often were just canaries in the mine. And what about those 16 women who first worked together with MIT in the 1990s, the ones who had been afraid to speak up for fear of being branded as whiners and losers? Four of the 16 women won the US National Medal of Science. 11 of us are, mem 11 of us are members of the National Academy of Sciences. P.S. with more space for fish tanks, that high-risk zebrafish experiment worked. When this work started years ago, I thought I understood the marginalization and undervaluation of faculty who are not part of the majority group. But I learned that each group that is not part of the majority encounters unique obstacles that can be invisible even to others who have been marginalized. As one African-American colleague, Professor Wesley Harris, told me, you have to walk in my shoes. If only there were a gene for learning to walk in other people's shoes. So what relevance do my two careers in science have for you, those of you graduating today? Being a scientist was certainly the greatest privilege of my life. Whether you become a basic scientist, an applied scientist, work in government, science policy, education, teaching primarily, you all share this privilege too now. Finding a path can be bumpy, but science is designed so people can change directions. There are many second chances. Plus, you have the best support network I know of. The faculty you worked with and your fellow students will be your mentors, your colleagues, and your friends for life. So just keep looking for the thing that's so exciting it doesn't feel like work and go for it. And what about plan D? I and my women faculty colleagues just wanted to be scientists. But we came upon a different kind of problem that couldn't be ignored. Individually, we weren't able to solve it, but collectively, using our training as scientists to analyze problems, we found a way forward. Looking back, you could almost write a protocol. Work as a group, collect numerical data and personal experiences, use a common language to recruit powerful champions who can make change, use carrots and sticks as needed, and keep paying attention because without energy, things can default to the status quo. As in science itself, fixing is a work in progress, still evolving. All we know for sure is that time alone doesn't fix complex societal problems people do. You who are graduating are a group of very special people with the scientific skills to solve hard problems. But science, in the narrowest sense of the word, is usually insufficient to solve problems that interface with society. Remember, as scientists, you're unique, uniquely equipped to advance the importance of evidence in decision-making and in problem-solving. Right now, your job is to focus intensely on your path in science and in your personal lives. But your generation is well ahead of mine in valuing diversity. Just by paying attention, you can help your workplace achieve the highest potential from all, and all will benefit. Keep remembering your dean. We all are one. And if the opportunity arises, please remember me. And don't try to avoid societal problems as I did for so many years. Be scientists who are not afraid to use science to be agents of social change. Thank you for what you have already accomplished. Thank you for what you will accomplish. Congratulations to you. Thank you.